as I was preparing for this message, uh, I got to thinking of a song. This song goes way back, so some of you may not even know the song, uh, but it was a song popularized by Peter, Paul, and Mary. Who ever heard of Peter, Paul, and Mary? Anybody in the room? Okay, so a few of you, good, you're good. Uh, and so then uh, the song, there's a song uh, entitled, uh, If I Had a Hammer. If I Had a Hammer. And so the lyrics are, if I had a hammer, I'd hammer in the morning. I'd hammer in the evening all over this land. I'd hammer out danger, I'd hammer out a warning. I'd hammer out the love between my brothers and sisters, oh, 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 all over this land. He goes on to say, if I had a bell, I'd ring it in the morning. I'd ring it in the evening all over this land. I'd ring out a warning. Uh, I'd, I'd ring out uh, for these things and, and, and all over this land. He goes on to say a third, third thing, if I had a song, I'd sing it in the morning. I'd sing it in the evening all over this land. I'd sing out danger. I'd sing out a warning. I'd sing out the love between my brothers and sisters. Oh, all over this land. And then the song goes and culminates in, I do have a hammer. I do have a bell. And I do have a song. And I'm going to sound out the warning. I'm going to sound out the danger. And I'm going to sound out the love between my brothers and my sisters. Come on, this song is very interesting because it says, if I had a hammer, this is what I would do. If I had a bell... This is what I would do. If I had a song, this is what I would do. And that got to me to thinking about our lives and how, how sometimes in our interaction with God, we pose those same kind of statements. If I had, then I would do. If I had this, then I would do that. And yet God has already provided you and me with things. Sometimes we're unaware of those things, but not likely. Some of us are very keenly aware of the things that God has provided to us, the gifts, the talents, the treasures, the things he's placed on us and in us to use for his glory and his honor, to help the kingdom, to advance the kingdom, to help the local church. And so this also then led me into thinking about Moses God appears to Moses. God appears to Moses in the flame of fire from the center of a burning bush. And Moses steps back and marvels, as I'm sure we would all marvel. I'm marveling for a variety of reasons. Number one, there's a voice coming from the inside of this plant. Number two, this plant's on fire, and yet the, the fire is not consuming or destroying the plant. And God begins, as he, after he gets Moses' attention, God begins to speak to Moses about his plan for delivering his people from slavery in Egypt. Hey, Moses, I've got this plan. Now, listen, I've got your attention. You need to be paying attention to me. I'm, I'm sending you back to Egypt. So, if you know the story, Moses, Moses actually was raised in Egypt. Then after he uh, murdered somebody in Egypt, he fled. He's been a shepherd on the backside of the desert for a long time. God gets a hold of him, says, listen, I'm, send, I'm sending you back to Egypt. I'm sending you back to Egypt. When you get there, I want you to go see Pharaoh and tell him you're there to lead my people out of Egypt. And Moses responded enthusiastically, ready to accept God's marching orders. Why me? Why me? Why are you picking on me? So don't raise your hand here, but have you ever had that response to God's marching orders for you? Why me? And so Moses objects immediately to this plan that God has. And he begins to give reasons about why he should not be the one to do this. So he responds, why me? Why should I be the one? Come on. God says, Mo, don't worry. I'll be with you every step of the way. It's going to be all right. I'll be with you. Now, those are comforting words. And when we're sitting here in our pew just listening to the message, we think, yeah, God's going to be with me. I'm going to go for it. But the truth is, when we're the one God's speaking to and he says, i got this plan, he said, I'll be with you, Moses' response is probably not too unlike ours. Time out. I heard you say you're going to be with me. So I'm going to go to these people. I'm going to tell them you sent me. Okay, great. But what if, for us, and now he's going to be to speculate on God's plan. Suppose these people say, 
Oh, he spoke to you, huh? Uh, what's his name? What's God's name, huh? Huh? What am I supposed to say then? They're going to put me on the spot, and you're, you said you'd be with me, but I'm pretty sure I'm going to be standing out and look like an idiot. I have no answer for this. Now, some of you probably are thinking, oh, you know, I'm easygoing and nothing ever, ever bothers me. But others of you are thinking, yeah, I never want to look like an idiot in public. Not intentionally. So Moses has this thought, I'm going to look like an idiot. God says, no, M Moses, listen, listen. When, if they ask you who sent you, you just tell them, I am sent you on this mission. Now, Moses is not satisfied with this even, and so he continues to speak to the Lord about this. And he says, they're not going to trust me. They're not going to believe me. Look, they're going to say, uh, oh, yeah, God spoke to you, really? <laughs> we got this guy over here. He says God spoke to him. Again, Moses is completely concerned about his own welfare and how the optics are going to look for him. But God doesn't let him off the hook, and so Moses is standing there and, and again, objecting to everything that God says, and God responds to Moses' most recent objection with a simple question, Moses, what is that in your hand? What's in your hand, Moses? Moses. And that brings me to the title of tonight's message, which is, What's in Your Hand? God will speak to you as He speaks to me, as He spoke to Moses. God will give you some direction for your life. God will begin to unveil a plan that He has for you. God begin to unveil a plan that He has for me. He says, David, here's what I want you to do. It's easy for me to say when, when, when somebody's telling me, God, God has a plan for me, this is what He told me, David. I'll be like, Go for it. Now, when God's speaking to me, I'm less likely to say, go for it. I'm thinking, uh, now don't look at me like that because you have some of those same moments. Part of the process goes like this, uh, like, like Moses. You, you sure you got the right guy? Why me? Why are you picking me? But God works with, works through Mo. Why, God walked through the process with Moses, and God will walk through the process with you. I love this story because it doesn't say that God threw up his hands in the air, said, listen, your first objection was enough, but then you went to another, and then you went to another, I'm tired of this, I'm out of here, I'm finding somebody else to, to do my bidding for me. God does not do that. He persists. And so Moses is just like, so he's, what's in your hand? What is that in your hand? And that takes us to Exodus chapter 4. Exodus chapter 4, and God said, what's that in your hand? And Moses responds, a rod or a staff or a stick, however you want to call it. And God instructs him in the next sentence, throw it on the ground. Now, this is an interesting state of affairs going on here because they're having this discussion going back and forth. God wants Moses to do something. Moses keeps injecting. God raises something else up. Moses says, no. God asked him, what's in your hand? He said, I've got a staff. I've got a stick. I've got a rod. God says, throw it down. Well, first of all, why is, Mo why is Moses carrying a stick? Is he like Teddy Roosevelt, speak softly and carry a big stick? And the answer is no. Remember, he's been playing the part of a shepherd. And shepherds carry staffs. It's part of the equipment. It's a tool of the trade. The stick is not merely a decoration a piece to show, hey, look, look at my staff. Isn't this impressive? It's got inlaid stone. No, it's just a stick. Moses uses that stick to gently guide his sheep. Moses uses that stick to rescue sheep. If you've ever seen a shepherd's staff, it has the hook on top. That hook is not just for looks. That hook is actually when sheep are caught in places that the shepherd cannot extract them from, they turn it to the hook side to, to grab hold of the body of the sheep and try to pull them out of precarious or dangerous situations. The stick is also used to ward off predators. He can swing that stick. He can strike, he can strike predators with the stick. And, of course, sometimes when Moses is relaxing at home on the couch, 
He doesn't want to get up and get the remote. He can use a stick to get the remote a little closer so he can change the channel on his TV. So there's a lot, variety of reasons that Moses has this stick, but primarily because he's a shepherd. So the stick is a vital part of his life. It's an essential element, not unlike uh, cell phones for us. For many of us now, the cell phone has become an essential part of life. Now, God had just told Moses, throw the stick down. What's going through Moses' mind? This is a tool of the trade. This is something I use daily. It's an important element of what I do as a shepherd. Throw it down. Could Moses potentially be thinking, am I like throwing it down like you want me to get rid of it forever? Like I'm never going to use this again? I'm a shepherd. Wait a minute. Imagine that you came in and I said, hey. In fact, right now, everybody bring your cell phone, bring your cell phone up and put it in here. Every one of you put your cell phones in here. Now, some of, some, some of you would panic immediately. Hyperventilate. <laughs> Now, why would we be that way about our phones? Because our phones have become an extension of us. Our cell phones have contact information. Our cell phones have photographs that are important to us. Our, phone, our cell phones have banking information. Our cell phones have passwords. Our cell phones have so much information that you would be very hesitant to give your phone up to anybody. In fact, uh, if you're like teenagers and you leave your phone behind somewhere, like if the student leaves their phone back in my class, and it happens sometimes, they'll come back during the next class. Is my phone here? I left my phone here. <laughs> and that, yeah, it's right here. And I'm like, oh. So glad they found their phone. Now tell me you haven't been that way if you actually were at a restaurant and you're, where's my phone? Like you're halfway home. Where's my phone? You get a little jumpy because there's so much important information on that phone. And imagine, again, saying, throw it down. Just throw it down here. Throw it down here. Down here. And you're thinking, right, am I going to get a back pastor? I'll let you know. So God says, throw the stick down, throw your staff down. Moses has no idea what's going on. But the Bible does say that uh, Moses threw it on the ground. God said, throw it down, and Moses threw the stick on the ground. It doesn't tell us what was going on inside Moses' head, if there was any, any uh, concern but he did throw the stick down. Moses was obedient. Now, if you know the story of Moses, and uh, he did lead the Israelites out of Egypt, and the stick, his staff was used on many occasions. He and his staff, the stick, uh, were used on many occasions by God to perform miraculous feats. Now, was there anything outstanding about Moses? And the answer is no. He was an ordinary fellow. Was there anything outstanding about the stick? And the answer is no. It was just a piece of wood. And yet when, when Moses surrendered his will and his desire to what God wanted, God did tremendous things through the ordinary man with the ordinary piece of wood. So church, what's in your hand? What did God place in your hand? Because the truth is that if you surrender your will to God and you take that he's, thing that he's placed in your hand and you make it available for his use, he's going to take somebody like you and me who are ordinary, that thing in our hand that is ordinary, and he's going to do miraculous things with it, supernatural things with it, amazing things with it, wondrous things with it, things that will, things that will bring him glory and honor. God wants to use what's in your hand. Church, what's in your hand? If I only had, if I only had, if I only had, and God says, look in your hand. I've already placed some things in your hand. What are you doing with them? You remember the story of the talents? The one got ten, one got five, one got one. Remember those stories? Yes. Okay, good. And so, so God gave each of the three people something. Two of them used the talent and the gift that God gave, and one did not. If I would have, if I would have had more, if I would have had this, I, God didn't say, "Okay, yeah, you're right. I only gave you one, so you're correct. You couldn't do much with that." God actually reprimanded that person for not using what He was given. And so we need to put to use what God's given us. And so, church, what is in your hand? What is in your hand? For many years, I've shared uh, time and time again 
about how I uh, pick up coins I find on the ground. From the quarter to the lowly penny, I pick up coins that I find on the ground, and I have for many years. When we were traveling to Columbia, we were walking through the airport, and I looked down, and there was a shiny penny. And I don't know if anybody saw me, but I picked it up. And I picked it up, and I usually say something to this effect, Lord, thank you for increasing me today. Thank you for causing me to prosper. And when I tell this story, I know that some of you are rolling your eyes on the inside. Really? A penny? Are you kidding me? <laughs> but I pick up those coins again and again and again. And I give thanks to God. Thank you for prospering me. Thank you for prospering me. And so this reminds me of the, of the, uh, the widow comes to the temple, Jesus is watching people bring their offering, their money, their coins, and place it in the treasury or the, or the offering box. Lots of people come by, and wealthy people are giving money, but then he watches and sees this one woman, this widow woman. And the Bible says in modern language that she put in a couple of coins, a couple of pennies. She threw a few pennies in the box. And Jesus' response, he's watching all of this, and he said, let me tell you something. Let me tell you about this lady. She brought in just a couple of pennies. This lady has given more, more than those, the others who have brought things today. For they have given out of their abundance, but she gave all that she had. She gave it her all. She took what she had in her hands, and she made her contribution. She didn't hold it back. She didn't, she didn't look around and say, oh, you know, if I just, you know, I'd give the two cents if I had ten cents. You know, if I had ten dollars in my wallet, I'd give the two cents easily, gladly. Jesus said it was all she had, and she gave all she had. And aside from money, let's take money out of the picture for a second, are we giving all we have to the kingdom? Again, I'm talking about taking money out of the picture for a second because I don't want you thinking, am I going to take offering in a minute? Are we giving all we have? Are we giving the best we have? What's the best? Well, that's for you to measure, but one, time, one way I think about the best is this. Every day in school, every day of my life that I've worked in school, Children come to my classrooms. And I know that those children who sit in front of me day after day, month after year, year, week after week, month after month, year after year, it's somebody's best. It's somebody's best. And I can look at them like, what a punk. But this is somebody's best. They're sending me the, their best child they have. What do they want me to do? To make the best thing I can make out of that child. And all God's asking you and me to do is bring our best. Don't compare it over there and over there and over there. This is my best, Lord. I'm not holding back. Here's my two cents. And I don't mean two cents as giving a piece of my mind. We're just giving our best to him. And so that caused me to think about this woman gave her best and, and me telling a story about how I collect coins. And I have a, uh, a, a five-gallon bottle in my, in my uh, house. And every time I find coins, I put them in my pocket, of course. When I come in the house, I put them in this five-gallon uh, jug. And it's about a third of the way full now with coins. Now, I have here, and you won't be able to see them all, but I have here um, lots of rolled coins. These are pennies. These are, there's $2 worth of coins in here. And these are all, this is a whole thing of coins, rolled coins. You say, why are you carrying that? Well, last week, at the beginning of service, one of our church members came, and he said that Pastor David talked about picking up coins, and for three years, I've been picking up coins. And these are the coins that I've collected over the last three years. This, this was A.T., if you know who A.T. is. I said, I picked, he said these all, all these came off the ground somewhere. He said, I picked up all these coins in the last three years. 
and I want to give it to the children's department. Now, come on, we look, we look at the lowly penny and say, ah, it's just a penny. We look at the dime, ah, it's just a dime. Right? Some of us look at coins, especially the penny, because the penny is, you know, what do you get with a penny anymore? When I was a kid, you could at least buy a piece of gum with a penny. But now the penny is kind of like, eh, whatever. For some, it's just chump change. Those coins are just chump change. But come on, a penny with a dime with a quarter, that adds up. And things can be done with a seemingly insignificant penny when it's combined with other things. God can multiply these things and bring glory and honor to what he does. So again, church, what's in your hand? What are you doing with the penny that God placed in your hand? Oh, it's just a penny. If I had something more to give, I would give. And God is asking you and me to just put into practice what he's given us. We need to be careful that we don't look at the penny like the world does. It's just a penny. Lord, that's all I have. It's just all you gave me. Because remember, he looked at this woman, this widow woman who gave her two cents. He said, man, she's given more than anybody else. She gave her all. And this is important to recognize. The Holy Spirit sought to put that story in Scripture so we understand that there are no insignificant gifts that are put in our hand that God cannot use, multiply, bless, and bring glory to himself. Every one of you, God has given you something that he can use to bring glory to himself. But if we look at it and belittle it or think that it's not enough, if I was like so-and-so, if I had what she had, if I had what he, then I would... No, put into practice what God gave you. This is th these kind of things that attack us are just the devil attempting to discourage us from doing what God's called us to do. He's good at it, incidentally, because some of us don't do what God's asked us to do. Here's a penny. Do something with it. it well, do something with the penny. And then it got me thinking also about the, 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 the boy with the five loaves and two fish. Come on, the five loaves and two fish. And so the people are out. There's over 5,000 people present. They're, 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 they're out away from the city. And Jesus said, man, these people have been out. They're hungry. Let's do something about this. The disciples look around. Andrew says, well, even if I worked for a year, there wouldn't be enough to buy food for everybody. And then he says... I found a little boy over here. He's got, he's got five loaves of bread and two fish. He's got five loaves of bread. He's excited, it sounds like, at first, but then this is what he says after that. But that is practically useless in feeding a crowd this large. This is Andrew speaking about what he found and immediately followed up with it, but this is practically useless for a crowd this large. Is Jesus deterred by this statement? The answer is no. Where's the boy? And all I have is my lunch. Can, can, can we have your lunch? Can we share your lunch with you? Sure. Here, Jesus. Unwraps the aluminum foil. There's the bread. There's the fish. Jesus said, have the people sit down. And then the Bible says, he, after he had given thanks, he began to distribute to his disciples who began to distribute to the people. And it said every one of them got their fill, number one. And number two, they took up 12 basketfuls afterwards. A little boy who gives his lunch to the cause, come on, look what God can do with a heart that's willing to share what he's been given. God can supernaturally multiply it and use it to bless other people. Church, what is in your hand? What did God place in your hand? Are you willing to take the lunch he put in your hand and say, Lord, this is for your glory and your use. What would you have me to do with this? Lord, I've got a couple of pennies in my pocket. What would you have me to do with this? Lord, I've got a stick. What would you have me to do with this? In all three of these situations, God supernaturally worked to bring glory to himself while meeting the needs of people. And so, church, the, the question that we have to ask ourselves again and again and again 
is what's in your hand? What's in my hand? What do I have to contribute? What do I have to offer? And I hear some voices right now saying, I don't have anything. You have something. Oh, yes, you do. If you're sitting here thinking you have nothing, that's the devil just, just trying to discourage you, that you have nothing to contribute and nothing to give. Do you have the gift of hospitality? Come on, you would know if you do, actually. Do you have the gift of hospitality? Because if you do, you could be serving this church as a greeter, as an usher. Do you have a love for children? And I know some of you do. Not just a passing, oh, the kids are nice. But you have a love for children. And you want God's best for them. You could be serving in the, in the children's department, in the children's ministry. Do you have a knack for cleaning that you actually enjoy that process? You're a behind-the-scenes person. You don't mind vacuuming. You don't mind dusting. You don't mind cleaning walls. Come on, there's a place for you in the church. We're talking about what's in your hand and putting it to use. Do you have a love for teenagers? I've worked with teenagers since 1978. That's not an exaggeration. It's the truth. I've worked with teenagers since 1978. In ministry, when I would have uh, adults wanting to help out, number one, first question I ask is, are you born again or saved? I don't need people who don't know Jesus. But number two, my second most important question, do you love teenagers? Not do you like them or do you tolerate them, do you love them? Because if you love teenagers, come on, there's a place in the church for you in youth ministry. Do you enjoy paperwork? Do you enjoy filing? Do you enjoy data entry? Come on, there's a place for you in the church office. I hate paperwork. I can do it, but I hate it. But then I've been around people, and sadly, I didn't understand it. Some people loved it, and I said, I'm really sorry you have to do this paperwork. There's a lady we used to work with many years ago, and she said to me, I love it. I'm like, because I was pushing off on her, my feeling about it. And I'm thinking, wait, there are people who love this kind of thing? And so if that's you, we have a place in the church office for you. Do you have a flair for the performing arts? We could use you to, to bring life to some of our sermons. Do you enjoy technology? You could be creating PowerPoints, presentations, videos, making, creating apps for us. Come on, we need your hands to carry out the vision in our hearts. We need your hands to help us carry out the vision that's in our hearts. And so will you let God use his extraordinary power to be put on display through what he's put in your hand? Now, I don't want you to leave this place thinking, okay, that was a nice sermon. I'm looking for people to say, I've got something. And the church has needs. What can I do with my something? There are more and more people attending here all the time. If you didn't notice... And there are many great needs here. And you have some contribution that will meet the needs of this local body, that will be a blessing to the kingdom, and watch what happens when God, you let God use you. And you let God work through you. Here's my stick. Here's my two cents. Here's my lunch. What do you want to do with it, Lord? What do you want to do with it? 